Suppose you get tested for SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus that causes COVID-19. What are the chances that you actually are positive or actually are negative? Well, you might expect that that depends on the accuracy of the test, and indeed it does, and different types of tests have different types of accuracies. But what you might not expect is that it also depends on the prevalence of the disease within the population. Indeed, in this video, we're going to look at Bayes' theorem, which is a very powerful little piece of mathematics that gives us some insight on what the probability that you might have or not have a disease actually is. Now, before we get into the mathematics, we need to talk a little bit about what do we mean when we say a test is accurate. In fact, test accuracy actually subdivides into two different components. There's one factor called sensitivity, and then there's another factor called specificity. What's the difference? The idea with sensitivity is whether the test is sensitive enough to detect when someone actually has the virus. If you have a test with a low level of sensitivity, you might get a lot of false negatives because even though they may have the disease, the test is not sensitive enough to pick it up. And then specificity is the other side. Specificity says, do we know they actually have this specific disease? If you have a test with too low of a specificity, it may give you a lot of false positives where the test tells you have the disease, but you actually don't. Okay, so what is the situation in terms of sensitivity and specificity for the tests available for the coronavirus? Well, it turns out there's actually two different categories of tests that we're using right now. The first are genetic tests, and this is the ones you've seen most in the news when a number of new cases are reported. A genetic test is one where it goes and swabs your nasal cavity, and then it uses something called PCR or polymerase chain reaction to basically rapidly expand the amount of genetic code in the sample, and then it's able to test the actual genetic markers to see whether or not you have the test. Now, the good news is that these genetic tests have an extremely, extremely high amount of specificity. That is, if it says you're positive, you're extremely likely to actually be positive. Of course, we can never be 100% certain, maybe some sample gets confused in the lab, but nevertheless, very high degrees of specificity. Unfortunately, sensitivity isn't always as high. For example, if you get swabbed, you may actually have the disease, but it hasn't managed to pick up the virus in that particular swab, and this is more likely the case if it's early on and you have not developed as large a bloom of virus population in your nasal canal. And indeed, depending on the specific test, this could be better or worse. One example, for instance, in the United States that's very common is the Abbott lab test. And one study of this showed that it might have as much as a 15% false negative rate. That is, when it tests and says you're negative, but you actually are positive. And numbers like this are hugely problematic. Of course, it's quite hard to tell what the true numbers are in any particular case. It requires a lot of study to investigate. So those are the genetic tests, which in general have very, very high levels of specificity, but perhaps somewhat lower levels of sensitivity. The other completely different category of tests are called antibody tests. This is a collection of your blood to see whether you have the antibodies created by your immune system to fight the disease. And it has the benefit that it could look way in the past, and if you retain those antibodies for some time, even after you've gone clear, you no longer have any symptoms, you're no longer infectious, it might still show those antibodies. Similarly to genetic tests, the antibody tests also have some levels of false negatives, but what is perhaps more problematic is that they also have some amount of false positives, at least it depends on which particular antibody test. And this can be a really big problem. Indeed, one of the mechanisms by which this might happen is that it may detect something that was an antibody from some other coronavirus that doesn't necessarily cause COVID-19 specifically. And we're going to see that at least when the prevalence of the virus is low within society, that the probability that you actually have the disease despite testing positive in that scenario is going to be far larger than you might initially suspect. All right, so let's do some math. Now, to get started on our probability computation, I want to begin with the idea of conditional probabilities. And the first thing I'll do is just give some variable names just to make our notation a bit simpler. We'll say COV is just going to be, yes, you actually have the disease, and DF for disease-free, plus for that you test positive, and minus for that you test negative. Okay, with those labels stated, what is conditional probability? 
What I want to consider are things like, for example, the probability of cove bar plus, oh, what's going on? Now, the vertical bar that we have here means given. So this is read, what is the probability that you have COVID-19 given that you tested positive? In other words, we want to know if you go out and you get this positive result, what is the probability that you actually have it? That's what this conditional probability is representing. There's a whole bunch of different conditional probabilities. For example, another one is, what is the chance that you're disease-free if you test positive? This would be a false positive. It's saying you test positive, but you don't actually have it. You are disease-free. So that's another thing I'd be really interested in knowing. Likewise, you can ask, what is the probability that you have COVID-19 despite the fact that you test negative? That's a false negative. And then finally, we can ask, what's the probability that you're disease-free given that you test negative. All of these numbers are between zero and one or 100%. So how do you compute conditional probabilities? Well, one of the most powerful tools that we have is called Bayes' theorem. And Bayes' theorem is a way to relate one kind of conditional probability with another. So on the left-hand side, this P of A given B, I'm just using a generic A and B right now. This is the probability that A is true given that you know that B is true. And sometimes conditional probabilities are no one, easy to compute, and sometimes they're challenging. Now, the power of Bayes' theorem is that this conditional probability on the left that you want to compute, well, you can relate this to the probability of B given A. That is, you swapped the order around. Instead of being given B and asking the probability of A, we're given A and asked the probability of B. Sometimes one or the other of these might be easier. Indeed, Bayes' theorem gives this nice result. The other expressions, P of A and P of B, this is just what the generic probability of either A or B if you don't know anything else. Now, I have a whole video introducing this theorem and proving it from some elementary theorems in conditional probability, and you can check the link in the description for that if you wish. But we're going to use it for this business of testing. Okay, let me return the names at least to what we were talking about before with COVID-19 or being disease-free and testing positive or testing negative. This is just Bayes' theorem stated with those variable names. So in this case, I am asking if you test positive, what is the chance that you actually have the disease? Now, there's a numerator and a denominator in this expression. So if I focus just on the numerator, what's going on here? This is a product of two probabilities. And one of the facts of probabilities is that for independent events, the multiplication of probabilities is basically saying what's the probability that both of these things are true at the same time. It's an AND statement. So in other words, the numerator is saying, what is the probability that I both have COVID-19 and that I test for COVID-19? Now, if I then focus on the denominator, what's the probability that I test positive? Well, this is actually a bit complicated. The probability that you test positive actually depends on two different cases. There's one case, which is where you have the disease and then you test positive. And then there's another case, which is the false positive case, which is you do not have the disease, but you still test positive nevertheless. In Bayes' theorem, this is sometimes called the two bucket problem. And this denominator can basically be split into these two different cases. And so, when you do that, what you get is something slightly more complicated here. The expression has been broken up a bit. The numerator is exactly the same. But in the denominator, you break it up into these two different cases. The left of the two cases is the probability that you have COVID-19 and test positive. And the right one in the denominator is the probability that you do not, that you're disease-free, but that nevertheless you test positive. So the denominator is being broken up into these two different cases. Now, I do want to be clear, I'm a math professor, I'm not an epidemiologist or a virologist or a medical doctor, so I'm not trying to make actual predictions about the prevalence of COVID-19 in society, but I'm just going to make up a toy example that hopefully is at least within the ballpark of being some real numbers. So how about this? Let's imagine that I have a test that is 95% sensitive, 99% specific, and that the prevalence of the disease is 1% in the population. So again, no claims about whether those numbers are representing an actual test or the actual disease. But nevertheless, we have a good toy example. Okay, so let's look at our formula. Well, the first thing I'm going to see is that I have the probability of having COVID-19 in two different places. And here, if there's a 1% prevalence among the population, what I'm saying is that if you just pull people out random, there's a 1% chance that they actually have it. 
then the peak of COVID-19 is, well, 0.01. So I'm just going to replace zero, those numbers with 0.01. I then see two places where I have the probability of testing positive if you're given COVID-19. Now, this is in my data as well. I said that we have a 95% sensitive test. And those statements are conditional probabilities. The statement that it is 95% sensitive means that 95% of the time when you're given that you have coronavirus, you're going to test positive for it. So both of these numbers are 0.95, and I can plug those in as well. Okay, two more to go. I have the probability that you test positive given that you're actually disease-free. These were the false positives. You don't have the disease, but you still test positive. The fact that our test is 99% specific means that this value is going to be, well, 0 0.01. The chance that you test positive despite not having the disease is just, well, 1% of the time because it's 99% specific. And then finally, what's the probability that you don't have the disease? Well, if you didn't know anything else, and you said 1% of the population has it and 99 therefore does not, you'd put in 0.99 here. Plug out all those numbers and you get approximately 0 0.49 or approximately 50%. These Decimals be multiplied by 100 to convert to percents. Now, that should seem surprising, perhaps. Indeed, we start with a test that is 99% specific. In other words, it's got a very, very low rate of false positives. And yet, you get this positive result and only half the time you actually have the disease. Well, why would that be? Well, the issue is the prevalence. The disease is so rare in society if you assumed it having 1%. And the result of this is that the false positive rate comes to be almost as large as the actual rate of prevalence itself, and that's sort of a 50-50 chance. To illustrate this a bit more cleanly, let me just imagine I have 100 random people and I'm going to go and test them. Now, if I have a 1% prevalence, then, well, approximately one of these people are actually sick at any given moment. And so if I then test all 100, so there's this one sick person, and with a 95% sensitivity, that means most of this time, this one sick person will be detected. But the false positive rate of 1% also means that one person here, on average, is also going to be a false positive. And so when you test all 100 people, you get this one false positive person, this one actually sick person who tests positive. You get two people that test positive, and therefore approximately a 50% chance that any individual one of them actually has the disease. So the point here is to illustrate that if you have a test, perhaps some of these antibody tests that are being tested for their own efficacy, if they have not sufficiently high levels of specificity, 99%, which seems like a big number, is actually not that great. Because even with 99%, if you have 1% prevalence in the population, it still is only accurate 50% of the time. And I think at least that might initially seem a bit counterintuitive. We can do the same basic computation for false negatives, but it's not so unintuitive this time. Indeed, if I just say, okay, exact same status, except for everywhere that I had a plus, I put a negative for testing negative. It's the same formula other than that. Well, if I plug in all the numbers, then I now get approximately 0 0.0005 or 0 0.05 of a percent. Basically, the 1% prevalence wasn't large enough to just change the probability away from what you would have expected it to be by just sort of naively guessing this particular result. Whereas in the previous case, the prevalence worked against the idea of false positives. You got very different results. If you have a question about this video, leave them down in the comments. If you enjoyed it, give it a like for that YouTube algorithm, and we'll do some more math in the next video.